Welcome to another episode of Tech Society, a bi-weekly podcast that offers a cohesive picture of what's happening in the ever-changing world of technology and modern society. Now your hosts, Alex Stunmo and John Newen. And before we begin this episode, just quickly, is it time for your business to evolve? Yes, it is. So come see Ninja Software, njs.dev. All right, let's get into the episode. Welcome to another episode of Tech Society. In this episode, we bring back Dr. Paola Magni to learn more about the life of a forensic entomologist. Paola is a forensic scientist, deputy dean and director of script at Murdoch University, Singapore, and winner of Business News 40 Under 40. In this episode, you'll learn what is a forensic entomologist and how rare are academics in this profession. How can the discipline of forensic entomology be used to fight crime and solve mysteries? And what kind of cutting edge technologies exist today in the space? We asked Paola to elaborate on her crazy stories throughout her career, from tracking corpses in the water, to hunting down origins of contaminants to resolve corporate disputes, all the way through to investigating accusations of witchcraft. Can you give us a like potted history of, I know you kind of did before, but maybe just a bit more information of you know, your career, where you started and how okay. you got here. <laughs> okay, well, it's an interesting story, <laughs> if you want to say that, because w- when I graduated at the high school and I had to start the university, I had no idea that forensic science was a thing. There were no CSI movies in TV. The maximum thing that you could watch was uh, Murder, She Wrote. That <laughs> was uh, like <laughs> was everything based on if the person that dies also bangs his watch just to see the time of death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was take or leave it. And there was always the policeman that didn't know anything and the pathologies of the little countryside lay place that was not getting the right information. But Jessica Fletcher was, yeah, all over the place. Mm. And she was, yeah, bringing very unluck uh, to every place that she was going because <laughs> every time she was around, somebody was dying. But she was solving all the cases. It was interesting. It was a, a nice something to something nice to watch but that's pretty much it i was not even thinking that could be my work so forensic science was not a thing if you could if you wanted to study something about criminalistics or criminology you had to be part of the police academy somehow Mm. and was something that was provided to you because that was part of the courses and your your preparation in general training or become a pathologist, study medicine for six years, and maybe become a forensic pathologist, medical mm-hmm. legal, and so s- three, five more years o- of study. But no, well, that was not for me, and I, I was not interested. No. Yeah. So instead, I was extremely interested in nature and environment and animals, but not as a not from the veterinary point of view. I don't want to save anything. I just want to watch them and learn about <laughs> them. You know, I was in love with that, that documentary. Is like David Attenborough kind of documentaries. Yep. We have a, a guy that is called Piero Angela in Italy. That is similar situation, kind of the same age, old mm. guy, knows everything, nice voice, and take you through the savanna and the underwater environment and yeah, beautiful things and. Uh, so yeah, that was okay. I want to do that because I really like it. So I enrolled in natural sciences. That is mm-hmm. a degree in uh, is a combined course between uh, geology and biology. So half science of life, half science of the earth. So you really try to understand what's going on in the environment. The bio- if you have a plant, the biologist will look the green part and the trunk. The mm-hmm. geologist will look at the soil and the vase. But the naturalist, the person that studies natural sciences, knows a little bit about everything, plus also the air around and maybe about the people that are looking at the plants, so the, also the anthropological side. So uh, that looks like more complete to me, more efficient. If you want to learn later, you can't only stick with the living part of the, of the soil. So I was studying that. I was loving it. And uh, <laughs> typical teenage girl, 
doing natural sciences, my my free time I was breeding snakes. <laughs> 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 I had this crush for yeah strange animals, and I had a few tanks with uh, frogs and lizards, and I even had a monitor lizard that was oh, not wow. even. That thing grew quite large. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Tell my mom about that. <laughs> yeah. It was a monitor lizard that was uh, a rescue animal. So I was uh, having that for a, uh, for, for a little while, which was, uh, yeah, recovering from an injury from a truck in, uh, in the desert of the Sahara in, uh, in Morocco. Mm. And then I had a few frogs because part of my research was into the genetics of certain type of frogs that I, I personally capture in Kazakhstan. So <laughs> I traveled the world <laughs> to do this crisis and traveling back home and st- trying to study and prepare these theses, this this research about this, I was not happy. Feeling like, okay, this is science for sure because I'm using the scientific method and so observation, hypothesis, you know, statistics, l- law theories, and you write and things. But at the end of the day, knowing more about chromosome of frogs, what is going to take me to like, w- w- mm. how can what's i the, uh, what's the end game yeah right? what's the end game how can i i don't know help society you know mm. get the nobel prize uh, <laughs> going to stockholm bring my mom so well, i wasn't i had a, like a middle age crisis at 22 <laughs> 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 consider that the uni- you start the university around 19 mm. in uh, in italy because that is the the normal course of, st- of things so yeah 22 was like oh my god what i'm doing i put myself in a situation of slide indoors i said okay i'm gonna apply for this uh, grant to do another research alongside my studies and if i pass this i will continue on this on this Mm. frogs business and if not maybe it's the universe it's the environment it's the sky whatever you think the energy (laughs) that is telling me something and i will uh, do a go for a different direction i didn't get that grant Mm. so that was this you know this Okay, wow. these lighting doors that was closed. And okay, let's let's see what happened next. Yeah. And what happened next was was the fact that I was actually studying astronomy, a course of astronomy, and I had a big fight with the professor there. <laughs> 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 Not a very nice fight. And I decided to drop the course and I had to include something instead of uh, astronomy. And I decided for entomology. Entomology is the study of insects, so it's mm. sp- <laughs> really different from the sky and the stars to the bugs. <laughs> That's a b- <laughs> that was a big fight for me to decide something like this. In doing this, I started this course and the professor started saying very, very simple things like, okay, bugs are everywhere, are the animals more representative of life everywhere mm. in the world, everywhere in the world you can find bugs. You can find bugs in your, in your cupboard, in your kitchen, in your bed, but mm-hmm. also in the desert or in the glaciers, even mm. underwater, you can find insects. They're really everywhere because they can uh, survive with different fo- sources. They are very strong. You know, there is the old tale about everyone who's going to die, but cockroach will survive. Yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there are not that many people that study insects compared to the number and type of insects that are available. There are some entomologists that study insects that are uh, beautiful, like mm. butterflies, mm. Mm, beetles. Insects that are a big damage for the society for whatever reason. They are pests, they are pests of agriculture, they bring uh, all their vectors of diseases, things. Or they are very useful insects. Imagine bees and pollinators and, mm. uh, you know, biological fights against aphids or other. And by the way, oh, then there are some people that study specific groups just because they are sick of that group. They just like it, <laughs> just want to work on that. And by the way, in the last few years, there are some people... They are starting looking at the insects, study the insects that can be found at the crime scene mm. to help the investigations about different things. Can be medical legal investigation, can be veterinary investigation, can be stored products investigation. So what can, why do you find these bugs in your sandwich? Mm. <laughs> and also urban entomology, why you find the bugs in the hotel, for example. So mm. this can help the investigation. So they need an entomologist to identify what kind of bugs what kind of damage from how long are there how we can avoid them how did they arrive there mm. so this can help in making some like backtrack the story backtrack the information and provide the basics for to the for the police and the prosecutor to provide a charge to whoever did their own thing 
Yeah. So uh, all this all this process of using bugs to do some crime investigation is this is this a new thing? The forensic entomology, so the use of insects for for uh, criminal investigation, is considered to be born in. Uh, uh, 1890 at, at the end of 1800 because of a, a publication by a, a French veterinary of the army who was studying the decomposition of dogs during the war. Mm. That was the first work, the first research that was done using the scientific method. But <laughs> said that before it was very well known that insects go on uh, cadavers and can destroy cadavers or can be uh, used for for the composition process for an active cleaning of wounds, for example. Mm, yeah, of course. So um, even on the Bible, there is written something about bugs in that sense. Mm. If you go even back in the Bible, the Lord of the Flies, Balzebu, that is one of the name of the devil, mm. Is, mm. is is something about the fact that it's about death, devil, and flies. If you think that Samson, you know, the, the guy with long hair, at some point, one of the seven fatigue that he has to do to prove himself was killing a lion. Then he comes back to see the carcass of the lion and there are insects buzzing mm. in the lion. So there was this story of the decomposition. There yeah. was a little story inside of the, the Samson and lion that is in the lion there were no flies, but there were bees. But this is because there was a misunderstanding in the entomology. <laughs> a mistranslation. Yeah. No, no, it was a misunderstanding of the people thinking that oh. uh, noble animals like horses of lions, they make bees. <laughs> really? <laughs> but very common and basic animals like dogs and donkeys, they make flies. <laughs> <laughs> but the misunderstanding comes from the fact that some of the flies that decompose bodies have the same colors of bees. Um, is a mimicry is yeah. uh, so these flies they try to resemble uh, wasps so they are black and yellow but they really look li- look alike so yeah. from people from far away you say oh wow oh, well a that's a wasp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was um, is a is an interesting thing about mythology and the flies and the bees and the and the and the history it's it's kind of recent but mm. it's not so back to my story yeah that this big bug oh wow bugs so nature bugs doesn't matter i can use i was not like interested in a specific group of animals i love mm. animals could be jellyfish sar- sharks or bugs as far as i can use them for an application that can be bigger than me and can be helpful for society so that was okay okay i can use bugs for criminal investigation for giving justice to mm. people and uh, closure to families oh, god only knows yeah so I looked into that and I found that in Italy it was really, really like super basic. There were a few things happening in the south of Italy in the 80s. Some pathologists were reading, writing some publications about corpse and maggots, but no much. It was something happening in in UK at the Natural History Museum of London, where there was a specific department of entomology with one or two people working on that. And just for chance, because things have to have like stars <laughs> must be aligned. In a few months from that moment in was, uh, which I was looking, at the Natural History Museum, there was going to be held the f- second conference of uh, the European Association for Forensic Entomology. So mm. I said, whoa, London, entomology, <laughs> this stuff, I think I'm going to go to London. So I got a cheap ticket and backpack pretty much and I went for the conference because I said, I want to listen to people that work in this because yeah. uh, there, there was no Google at the time. You can't Google the information. You had to go to the library and find out. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to really see if this is something that I really want to do. And then when I came back, there was like, nobody can stop me now because <laughs> this is really, really, really what I want to do. And so from that point, I had to... Yeah, be very bold and brave and ask everyone if I could do this because uh, there was not a discipline at the university, Mm. either in the natural sciences, chemistry or uh, biology or medical legal uh, or medicine. So I had to go through the health system and speak with the head of the uh, pathology department and say, can I work alongside your uh, pathologist and pick up the bugs, pretty much. (laughs) And they were, oh my God, you want to pick up the bugs? 
you are super welcome. <laughs> Red cap, we hate bugs. So if anyone comes around and want to deal with the bugs, we are so happy for that. <laughs> and that was the starting point. And my number was on the telephone that was used by the pathologist for the 24-7 work. And I was called on the scene to pick up the bugs, then the autopsy to pick up the bugs. And then all of these information from the bugs and the cases were part of my thesis that in a year time become a book, uh, mm -hmm. like a proper book that was a, is still a manual for, for the pathologists and the policemen in, uh, in Italy. And then, wow. and then they, they, <laughs> they were so happy that someone was picking the bugs that they gave me a job <laughs> over there. <laughs> so I worked for a few years at the, at the health department for the pathologists. And then I started working for the forensic veterinary department as well, because the victim can be either a person or an animal, and you can investigate pretty much in the same way. The bugs are pretty much the same. And in many cases, the law protects mo nearly more, uh, more the animals than the people, and especially if it's a protected animals like, like a dolphin or a bear. Mm. So I had different cases in that sense. And then... I started a PhD and I came to Australia because back in the days at UWA there was the Center for Forensic Science that was run by a professor, Professor Ina Dador, who was a forensic entomologist, wasn't the best in the world. He invited me over and oh, wow. that is the beginning of the end because then <laughs> I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> And then I improved my knowledge in bugs and I faced several cases of people found in aquatic environments, mm -hmm. so fresh water or salt water, and this was even more challenging, even more interesting, more difficult. So, oh, we need more knowledge about that. So I am driving my research on two sides, the terrestrial part with the flies and the aquatic part with crustaceans especially and plankton. So now I work in these two directions and in a classical way, like typical microscope and uh, gloves and yeah. uh, looking at things in a very classical way and the books and the pictures and also using new technologies like, for example, hyperspectral imaging, chemical like toxicology, toxicolo toxicology kind of tools like GCMS or HP. It depends what we mm. had to look after. So using new technologies to investigate classical things because they can give us more information. So, so yeah, all the, all the time you have to do lecturing and mm. then you have to do research. And sometimes the research can wait, sometimes cannot. Like this is the summer period is the moment in which we can work the most. But sometimes we just work in a way that we get the samples now and then we use them during winter. Basically, we are squirrels. <laughs> 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 we make reserve stuff for, for, the, for the winter time. And then there is a lot about writing, writing writing and reading because mm. you had to confirm what you say or reject what you other people did based on previous research mm. and sometimes it's a nightmare because there are so many research in certain areas that the review the literature takes months so this is the maybe the reason why i do something that nobody else does so i don't have to read too <laughs> much <laughs> everyone has to read what i do and then i have students to look after because obviously and teach others to do what I do mm. and we collaborate. We do stuff that I don't know what to do because they know more than me. So we collaborate from this in this sense and Are your students studying forensics in general or are they are they becoming uh, forensic entomologists as well. They study, majority of them, they study the Master in Forensic Science. Yeah. And in doing that, then at the end, they have to do um, a research and mm. then they decide for a discipline for their research. Can be blood state pattern analysis or can be entomology. When they come to me to ask for a research to do together, I, I normally try to convince them that I don't want to make them a classical entomology. So are you interested in bugs? Okay, how we can com connect the study of bugs with something that is new technology. Mm. So I have one that is um, going to do something in artificial intelligence oh, next wow. year to try to understand things. So somebody else did something in nanotechnology or hyperspectral imaging. So yes, the bugs, but looked from a different perspective because at the end of the day, nowadays when you go in a box they kind of don't trust you if you are the expert that you say that why well you you can say that somebody else can say something else but if mm. the machine says that <laughs> you can't challenge the machine because your machine is <laughs> the same of mine numbers are numbers statistics is statistics mm, so yeah. it's very important plus 
you know, you have the experience of six months or, or one year, depending on what type of research, in which you can focus your attention on two things instead of one. So you have a double possibility later on. You can work in one area or the other one or the two combined. Mm. So it's something that we try to prepare students for the world of work, providing them with a more, you know, robust kind of curriculum experience. They had to become confident in more than one thing. The skills that you've developed over all this time, how common is it across the entire world? Do you oh, have yeah, to, I was going to ask the exact you, same thing. <laughs> like, yeah. Back on my previous question. Is, is it like five of you? Or? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah the, the conference conventions have five people. Or, yeah. And also, <laughs> like, do you have to fly for, for to, to share your knowledge? So a few years ago, it was probably 2009, I worked with a girl that was studying uh, sociology and criminology. Mm -hmm. And we decided that for her thesis, the research was going to be a review of the forensic entomologists around the world. Mm -hmm. what how many? How many girls? How many boys? What kind of background do they have? What kind of experience they had? Are, are they just researchers? Are they policemen? They do research mm -hmm. and they work in uh, the police or they mm -hmm. work in a museum? do they work on cases some of them they call themselves forensic entomologists but they never see a body in their life mm -hmm. so there was a, a survey was really about the role of the forensic entomologists around the world at that time we counted 250 people wow. obviously we know that some of the people didn't answer to the questionnaire and mm -hmm. we know also that some of the people now don't work anymore and there are more mm -hmm. people now but yeah, still is a pretty niche kind yeah. of field. And this is the reason why it's kind of, it's important for the students that are interested in forensic entomology to know more than just classical entomology. They need mm -hmm. to know a little bit more to find a job because probably it's difficult to place a forensic entomologist. You can't, you can't go on seek.com and just type in. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very yeah. difficult. So, so yeah, there are not that many. In, and within the forensic entomology, uh, world, then there are n niche of the niche. For example, in the case of people that work in underwater stuff, we are mm. probably really five or six <laughs> of these people. Well, then wouldn't that be a very common requirement? Because I'd imagine that murderers dump a lot of bodies into into the water hypothetically right? yeah. yeah yeah this this is a pretty good point and this is the <laughs> point where i try to sell myself in this sense yeah. but the real thing is that it's very difficult so so become an expert in underwater investigation is very complex mm. and doing research underwater is very complex take time take a lot of effort in getting the permissions underwater things go slow so an mm. experiment that you can do in decomposition in 15 days in outside take a year and a half in uh, inside oh, wow. underwater yeah. so because it depends on the temperature the, the type of animals that are underwater so it's very very complex so there are less people that can do that mm. and then you have environment outside that is pretty much the same and then inside you have how many type of waters do you have? You have fresh water, salt water. Mm. So water can be deep or shallow. Fresh water, fresh water can be deep or shallow. Mm. And then you can have the, you know, uh, the... Um, the currents uh, move things around. And yeah, yeah, currents, yeah. no currents. You, you can have enclosed waters. You can have uh, artificial waters. You can have a tank or you can have a swimming pool. You can have so many different combinations, so many different combinations of animals and and chemical situation, it's really complex. So so it's this is the reason why I'm in Australia and I'm working on cases from Chile, from uh, mm, from uh, wow. from Italy and from the other side of Australia and et cetera, et cetera, because there are not that many people that do that. Mm. So do you, do you assist um, these other countries remotely or do you actually have to fly over there? It depends. Mm. Now, in the, old, in the old days? <laughs> in the old days, I had to move also because it's difficult to explain how to extract certain things, how to mm. take the bugs. In some cases, it's very difficult to bring the bugs into Australia, even if you say the bugs is dead, it's of not going to kill yeah, anyone. Yeah. We, obviously, you quarantine is very and, thing, oh. yeah. and it's time sensitive too, right? It takes like 20 hours to get there by flight. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah. A little bit of that and uh, it's... <laughs> is the the case itself takes certain time so mm. you have to consider all of these things together you also have to consider that the case if you had to bring an expert in the case is going to cost way more mm. so it depends what is the profile of the case typically mm. unfortunately the people are not the same so if wow. uh, the child of a uh, of a mba star dies 
is not like a hooker in the suburb, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. So we are all humans. We should have all the rights to have a full, f- investigation. A full investigation, fair yeah. investigation with all the things that is possible to do. But the That's media attention is different. The yeah. Im- importance sounds to be difficult, different. So we have miscarriage of justice because this, the, you know, there is such a pressure mm. on the investigators, on the by the media and by the the people. Because mm. uh, it's completely Cause different. Yeah, the, the media cares about the outcome, whereas yeah, I had <laughs> yeah. cases in which there was these several cases in which the body at the beginning was not recognized and mm. then was recognized as the hooker, and then the case was immediately less important and less funds devoted yeah. to the investigation of the of the case. So it's sad. It's extremely sad for people that work in this case, not because the body is X, Y, Z, but because you want to know to have justice at the end of the case. Yeah. Because they have different importance, and uh, it's it's unbelievable for us. You've brought up like changes in technology a few times with all these acronyms that I haven't heard before, mm. and uh, hyper something spectrometry, spectrometry print. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually interested in like, has there been any super cool next-gen tech that's really flipped everything around or has it just been a slow increment change where you actually move from paper to excel you know <laughs> kind of stuff <laughs> i was discussing something uh, on my way here with a friend at the phone and she's a pathologist and uh, she has uh, some data i need to do some stats because but i need someone that does the stats for me because i did my stats course at the beginning of my medical s- school that was in 1999 <laughs> and now and we were basically doing this on the paper and now there are all these software i yeah. actually don't have an idea where to start so yeah <laughs> some of the stuff i mean <laughs> excel definitely changed life there are many things that uh, we try to achieve in terms of criminal investigation that is for example try to don't touch the evidence because every time you touch the evidence you're going to modify the evidence and 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 this is a very important point so the hyperspectral imaging is a passive way is a mm. passive way to investigate stuff without even touching it. So can, that you, tell is can you tell us more <laughs> yeah, about what, what it is? <laughs> okay, yeah. imagine a, um, a camera, a normal camera. Yeah. Uh, take images, takes images, and what you see is something around the spectrum of the visible light. Yes. yes. Okay. And yeah. hyperspectral camera allows you to take the same image, but with a huge, a large spectrum, because from infrared to UV, instead oh. of just the visible. How, the it, how, how do you use that? Or how is it useful? I must know. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. all of what you see can be actually translated in numbers of wavelength. Okay. Okay. So this the wavelength. It, mm. depending on what you see, the colors and things, mm. up numbers. And they can change if the images change. So the reflectance of what you see is different in the different spectrum, but only if you had the technology to see this spectrum. Mm. So something that you, you see this way, if you see that way, can be way more different. Yeah. Allo- hyperspectral imaging also allows you to see things that are not just on the surface. So initially, this technology was used to I- identify the presence of uh, specific metal under the soil. Like, is there any uh, gold? Do I have to dig? Yeah, yeah. But if I take a picture and the soil gives me a wavelength, some numbers that are completely out and they can be similar to a library of data that says it's gold, well, this mm. is the place where I had to dig mm. instead of the other one. That's okay? cool. Yep. So imagine a situation in which, in my case, mm-hmm. I need to look inside of the cocoon of a fly. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the only way to do that is Without through... Without touching. Cut it open. Yeah, yeah, I have to yeah. cut it open. But if I cut it open, I will... Uh, modify the evidence you, you big can't time. do it again <laughs> you can't do yeah. it some people tried with a CT scan okay. some people tried with infrared yeah. but to do CT scan and infrared you had to kill the animal a picture doesn't kill anyone <laughs> So yeah. I can take the bug from the from the from the environment from the from the crime scene, put under the camera, take a picture. The picture go uh, to the software. The software gives you a line of numbers that can be translated in a wavelength, mm. and this compared to a library or compared to another bug can give me an information that is okay. It's toward this spectrum or the other one, so it's younger or l- or okay. Or, oh, or, wow. Or, so you can yes. tell like how long it since it hatched and 
that kind of thing is can tell me from how long is 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 in the intrapupareal form how long is a cocoon so is it closer to the mega time or is it closer to the to the fly fly away time mm. yeah wow so since the cocoon time that is called the pupil time is the longest period of the immature life of an insect that can mm. be even 40 or 50% of the life that can be days so with a picture i can say it's one day or it's 10 days that together with the other data can give me a, a time frame that is based on the temperature it's more complex than that mm. yeah. but the the point is that this technology allow me to have a passive information without even touching that's cool. The, the, the evidence. So do these cameras look different to a normal camera? Uh, this is gigantic. No, attraction. no, absolutely. And now they cost pretty much like a, like a good camera. And okay. they can oh, be wow. attached to a microscope, so you can, uh, you can use that only on also on very small things. You can attach them to drones, so you can fly uh. them away around, and you can take images of a crop field, and you can have information if the crop field is... Uh, uh, is paras- as is uh, colonized by oh. parasites or oh, not? Wow. So it's it's really it's it's great. I use that for for entomology, but also for aquatic stuff. For example, one recent uh, research we did together with one of my students was about the changing of the structure of fabrics after a certain time underwater. Mm. So we had different type of fabrics. We had cotton, neoprene, satin, and velvet. Mm-hmm. And we left this stuff for six months underwater, taking uh, information every 15 days or so. Okay, visually, you can say something, but you know, I say it's nice, you say it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't have an, an empirical way to, yeah. to, to say that. From the biological point of view, we can say, okay, from the biological point of view, I can say after a couple of weeks, I have nothing. But mm. after four weeks, I have the first barnacles that are very small and only these species. So they can give me a biological information. But if I don't have the barnacles, the hyperspectral imaging can show me that the reflectance of a fabric that is getting ruined by water mm. is changing the, the wavelength. So... Mm. The aquaspectral can give me information when biology is not helpful yeah. or when bio- biology is helpful but can give me a plus information. Yeah. Cool. So, boom. Yeah, that's <laughs> really cool. Yeah. Any other really fun stories like where the insect caught the perp? Yeah, different situations where, where there are proper murders in which the time was really spot on and then there was the famous case of the cat of the black magic. So, there was this place in which People were saying that there was people coming and doing some rituals, like satanic rituals, or so kind of strange thing. rituals yeah. and mm. things. And a bunch of cats were found there, kind of, how to say, mummified kind oh, of cats. Wow. But naturally mummified, no, not like mummified. Yeah, with okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so the work was about that and was about trying to understand if the time frame of, of the death was connected to the time in which people were saying they were the rituals mm. was not so <laughs> but then i found out later on that apparently cats that are used for rituals they use the the posterior legs for the rituals and okay. all the cats had the posterior legs in the, in the right place so it was <laughs> oh, <laughs> fine that's so strange another case was a case about this was cool because a case of store product entomology <laughs> so nobody died there Okay. This factory that was making specific fabric that was sold everywhere in the world and made in big structures and sent all over, all over the world. And one of these big containers arrived to the UK and there was a dead mouse. Mm. And this dead mouse was full of flies and made everything dirty. And this fabric was used for something that was like female tampons and things. So it, oh, it's, wow. it was yeah. <laughs> not exactly <laughs> what you want in something like that. Uh, so who is the faulty p- part here? Can be the factory that made the fabric and didn't look after the hygiene of the place or can mm. be the, the people that moved the container or can be even the uh, people that store the stuff in the UK. Mm. So you have three parties that are <laughs> all in suspense because all they don't pointing know. pointing at everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Long story short, <laughs> we did a little autopsy of the remains of the ba- of the mouse, and the mouse was uh, the different bones were okay, but the head was not like a mm. typical typical uh, injury from a, a mouse trap. Oh. But where we found the mouse, there was no way they could uh, could have a, an injury because it was basically in a box. Mm. Okay, so 
around the mouse there were a bunch of flies and, uh, and cocoons of flies, so pu- pu- paria, so the, the open, pu- open cocoons. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, let's have a look if this mouse was killed by this bang on his head or by something else. So I used the puparia for toxicological analysis. The idea is that if the mouse was poisoned, uh, the fly eat the ma- the dead mouse, the fly will get the poison themselves. And all so, that too. So oh, it's, wow. a, it's mm. a food chain kind of thing. Yeah. So it's the reason why pregnant women should not eat fish because they are full of mercurium that comes from other fish that eat blah, yeah. blah, blah. So it's a bi- bioaccumulation of substances. So I did the toxicological analysis and we found that the pubic had whatever rat poison. So go back to the factory and say, well, what kind of <laughs> red, <laughs> red poison do you guys do? And they didn't know I was looking for, for anything specific. So they, they gave me the information. It was stuff that I saw because there was this pest management company that was writing a piece of paper and things like, we use this, this and that. It was not that one. Oh, so interesting. Well, so long story short, someone from the factory was, was fired recently. And in the last night shift that he had in the factory, he brought a mouse that he killed at his place just to do the last prank to the, oh, to the company oh, wow. and put them in a very bad light with the customers. And That's so CityCan yeah. was, uh, was confirming all of that. And, but yeah, and the house of this guy, there was the, the mouse trap and there was the poison that was different. Yeah. And then, yeah, we saw him doing this <laughs> <laughs> in the, during the night by the city camera so yeah so the puparia of the fly were full <laughs> of drugs that gave us the the answer so that's really cool this is yeah. the beauty of using s- the evidence that csi doesn't consider <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> people don't think about that everyone everyone loves crime scene <laughs> investigation stories so we already asked you what your intro song is seeing as you're a underwater specialist in in, in crustaceans what would you name your boat <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good question oh god <laughs> well i actually have a crush for aquaman and so maybe i would call the thing aqua girl or something like that <laughs> <laughs> nice i like it <laughs> are you talking about aquaman or are we talking about the actor he's really cool well. <laughs> 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 they did a good combination of the things. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. That was amazing. I'm thank so Thank you glad so you much for having me again. Yes. Yeah. Good to see you again. <laughs> Any? What's your What's your kind of pitch to anyone who's swithering on whether they should um, get into forensic in- investigating insects? Well, probably don't think about the insects, but think about the investigation and what investigation means. That means critical thinking, multidisciplinary, thinking out of the box and uh, solving mysteries. That can be... I like that. Solving uh, mysteries. That can be really, Mm. really challenging. So it's really something that takes you out of your comfort zone, working with people, not Mm. just that people, but also living people, Mm. uh, (laughs) improves your collaboration, your communication, your meeting other people, maybe meeting other people from other countries because there is maybe a case of uh, a mass disaster in another country. So it can really open doors and open minds and open possibilities. So I love the opportunity of having the possibility to touch all of these little things and having the days that are always different because there is always something new that happens and cases are unique. You can't be bored with a situation like that. Amazing. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paolo. You've made it to the end of another episode of Tech Society. Thanks for listening. On this month in tech history, March 15th, 1985, the first internet domain in history was registered, Symbolics.com, a Massachusetts computer company. Make sure you hit us up on Twitter, at Tech Society. Head over to the website, subscribe to the newsletter. 